No, I'm very happy to introduce you to our next keynote speaker. He just flew in fresh from Silicon Valley or San Francisco. Um, he's an efficiency engineer named Jim Gao, and um, he is sort of what we can call Google's guru on machine learning. So welcome to the stage, Jim Gao. Perfect. Hi, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up? All right, perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a, truly a pleasure being here today. Um, unfortunately, uh, our, the, the original person who was supposed to give this speech, his name is Mustafa Suleiman, and he's the co-founder of DeepMind. But it turns out that even if you're the co-founder of a company, when the CEO of Google asks you to be Mountain View, you have to go to Mountain View. So instead, I'm going to be giving this talk today. But uh, fortunately, I think you'll be in good hands. I'm going to take you through what DeepMind does, our approach to artificial intelligence, and the way that we think AI can help change the energy world. So, you know, just a little bit about DeepMind first. Um, so we are a hybrid organization. So what that means is uh, DeepMind has about 400 people right now, but over half of the company is actually just pure R&D. So we're a very, very academic company. But, you know, being owned by Alphabet, we do have the, the scale of, of Google behind us, essentially, right? The scale of Google's computational infrastructure. And then finally, we really, really strongly believe in our social mission. DeepMind exists in order to use AI for good things. Now. Our mission is very, very uh, simple, and it's actually, uh, we're unabashedly idealistic about our mission, and there's only two steps, okay? So step one, we're gonna use AI to fundamentally solve intelligence. And step two, we're going to take that intelligence and use it to solve all the other hard problems in the world. And the reason why we think that is because there are very many uh, hard problems such as social inequality, such as water issues, such as energy, right, that have some really, really difficult problems associated with it. And we think that the way to solve some of these problems is to create learning systems that can learn by themselves so that we don't have to do the hard work of trying to custom tune models for every specific problem. So the way that we do this is very simple. Um, we actually start off with, uh, with generalized learning frameworks. So within machine learning, there are three branches, three main branches of machine learning, and that's unsupervised learning, where you don't actually tell your machine learning system what it's trying to learn. All you do is you shove a bunch of data into your system, and you say, OK, now find the hidden correlations in my data. Then there's supervised learning, where we take a set of inputs and we actually train our machine learning models to a, an exact output. So we actually are telling our machine learning system, hey, this is, you need to find the correlations that take that map this set of inputs into this particular output. And then finally, you have reinforcement learning. And this is the area that DeepMind specializes in. In reinforcement learning, uh, we learn by actively doing things. So for example, you know, as a human being, I learn not to touch a hot stove because when I touch that hot stove, I get burned, so that I know in the future this is not something that I should do. Well, in artificial intelligence, we use reinforcement learning for that same uh, generalized principle, where our agent will take an action upon the environment, it observes the impact that its actions had upon the environment, and then we feed that back into its reward metric, or the goal, right? Because every time you do something, we need to know if that action brought us closer or further away from our, from our reward metric. So we actually tested this out on, on Atari. Has anybody, do you, do you guys remember the Atari console? Raise your hand if you, all right, cool. I think most people here have. So there's lots of game in Atari, right? One of the really cool things about, uh, that we did in order to test our system was uh, on the Atari testbed. Specifically, we took a single agent, not, a custom, like, not multiple agents, but a single agent, and we trained it upon raw data in Atari. So literally, all it saw was the pure RGB pixels, right? Just pixel data. It knew nothing about the rules of the system. It knew nothing about you know, strategies of the system. It didn't even know what the possible actions within the system are. So you start from scratch, it's just pixels. And from that, we hope that our, our, um, our AI agent would learn to its own strategies and learn eventually to exceed human performance. Now, I could spend all day describing this to you or I could simply show you a video. So I think most folks will appreciate the video, right? So after 100 games, you can see that our agent doesn't really quite play very well, right? It doesn't really realize yet that the objective is to actually bounce the ball. And so it misses the ball a lot of the time, right? So this is like maybe infant level. But around 300 games, it plays at the level that you or I would be able to play at, right? So at least, you know, it's realized that in order to maximize its points, it's got to, you know, at least bounce the ball and, you know, not let the ball fall to the ground, right? But then something really interesting happens at 500 games. 
right? After 500 games, the agent has started developing superhuman strategies. It has learned, for example, that it needs to start bouncing the ball in, up between the roof and the top of the bricks. Now, this is something that's really, really important, and that gets to the heart of DeepMind's mission, right? We believe that AI is about augmenting human intelligence, right? It's about augmenting human capabilities to solve problems. That's really the, the, the goal of AI. And you can see that through, um, you know, through a single agent, that, that one agent was able to do that for breakout, but it's also able to do that for 50 or 60 other different games. It actually exceeded human performance in, in 50 to 60 other games. And that's really the power of generalized learning frameworks. It's about creating a generalized learning framework that can learn to solve very, very complicated problems by itself without us having to impart human knowledge upon it. Another example where we tested this is in the game of Go, right? So you may have heard recently that uh, that we had an Asian. It was called AlphaGo, and um, you know Go is an ancient Chinese game, right? It was invented like 3,000 years ago, and you know the Asian countries have been playing Go for many, many years, right? Now Go is a little bit different from chess. So uh, do folks remember when when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov? Right? Do, you, do you remember that was a really pivotal moment in chess, right? So Go is a little bit different from chess because in chess, there are roughly 250 million different ways of playing chess right? at any given moment. So what that means is we can actually comprehensively go through every single iteration of chess and actually solve how, that, that, um, you know, how that's going to play out. So you can choose the best action. Now, Go is very different because your average game of Go has about 10 raised to the 170th possible permutations of Go. Right? So for reference, that's more atoms than there are in the known universe. I think the universe only has something like only 10 raised to the 80th power of atoms, right? So this is a really, really big search space, and we're not going to solve it, even if you threw all the compute power that, that Google and Amazon and whomever has, right, at this problem, even after a billion years, you wouldn't solve this problem. So clearly, we need some kind of a better strategy to solve the game of Go. So what we did instead, actually, I got too excited. So what we did instead was uh, we trained an AI agent, very similar to what I just showed you in Atari, right? Where we actually trained an AI agent upon hundreds of thousands of human expert games. Right, so that it learned to mimic human behavior. And then we created an evaluation function, a neural network, that learned to identify the current state of the board and map it into some probability of, of winning the game afterwards. And when you combine these two neural networks together, right, it created something very powerful. So we trained on 100,000 human expert games, and then we moved it into a simulated environment where it could play millions of games against itself. And then we challenged the world's number one Go champion, Lisa Do, to a match. And I remember Lisa Do is an awesome guy. Guy, right? He's really, really nice. And, uh, and, but he was so confident that, you know, that he was going to win 5-0, to zero, he said. But instead, uh, AlphaGo won 4-1. to one. And a lot of the experts said that this was you know, a decade ahead of its time. Although, I think my favorite result actually out of all of this is, uh, is the cultural impact. So a lot of people watch the match, but my favorite statistic that came out of this was, you know, for the next couple months, there was a global, uh, worldwide Go sh board shortage because everybody went out and they bought all these Go boards, right? So, um, okay. So um, why did I start off by telling you guys about, uh, about uh, these games, right? Like, was it to really uh, emphasize how much we like video games and board games? I mean, it's, it's partly it, right? We do really like video games. We like playing video games. But um, I think the more important here is it's about generalized learning frameworks, right? It's about creating a single agent that is able to solve entire classes of problems by itself. It's about learning new strategies and discovering knowledge that didn't exist before, right? Augmenting human capabilities. So we needed to test this out on a real system. So one of the nice things about being owned by Alphabet is that Google has massive infrastructure, right, that uses lots and lots of energy. Specifically, our data centers use enormous amounts of electricity to provide the services that everybody uses on their mobile phones for Google search, et cetera, right? So this, this uh, diagram here is a super simplified uh, way that the data center works. But essentially, you have a server floor that is producing maybe 100 megawatts of heat. And the point of your cooling infrastructure is to remove that heat through a complicated a set of equipment such as your uh, your cooling towers, your chillers, your pumps, your valves, you know, etc. Right? And anytime you operate a piece of equipment, you need to have a reward metric, right? Like what is the goodness of your actions? So in data centers, the goodness of our actions is the energy usage, right? We measure how well we're operating by measuring how much energy we're consuming. And the objective is to minimize the amount of energy that we're consuming, or rather, you know, uh, optimize for PUE or power usage efficiency, right? Now it's 
really important to recognize that there are two constraints associated with this. We need to make sure that our actions uh, satisfy the temperature constraints as well as the pressure constraints. And that's really important because if you don't meet your temperature pressure constraints, you can really damage stuff inside a data center. And you know, these data centers are like billion dollar pieces of equipment, right? And you really, really don't want to be the person that crashes a billion dollar piece of equipment. So uh, to make this really concrete, um, the, the data that we had within the data center uh, falls into two categories, your state space and your action space, right? So in your state space, we have things like uh, power meters, right? flow meters, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, fault conditions, weather conditions, right? The eyes of our data center, if you will, is measured through sensory data. Just like in Atari, right, the, your, your, uh, the state space is comprised of your RGB pixels, right? Um, in actions, right, we, in our data center operators, we have actions like uh, which equipment are you running? How are you running them? What, what kind of temperature and pressure set points are you using when you're operating your equipment, right? What kind of, what kind of uh, valve positions do you, you know, do you have? How much flow are you pushing through your data center, right? It's just like in Atari, right, you have, you have a controller, right? You have your left button, your right button, right, your joystick controls. Well, in data centers, we have, uh, you know, we also have actions, but it's, you know, they're, they're, they're the data center operator actions, right? But you can see how the, the, the class of problems, right? This is a constrained optimization problem. And the same learning algorithm that can learn to optimize for Atari or AlphaGo can also apply for real world infrastructure. And that's what I'm gonna try to convince you of. So putting it all together, mathematically speaking, wow, there's a lot of clicks. Mathematically speaking, right, we can formulate this problem. So specifically, we take the state and action space that we're taking in right now, and we feed it into a model that needs to predict one hour ahead into the future. And the one hour ahead is a really, really important piece, right? Because when we first started doing this, we asked our artificial intelligence agent, okay, you know, maximize for the, for the instantaneous or optimize for the instantaneous energy usage. And that was a really bad idea because I, th I think many folks are starting to nod their heads. You know, you, you can see why. Our AI agent came back to us and it said, hey, I've got the solution for you. You need to turn off everything. Right. And that's going, to maximize, that's going to produce the highest possible efficiency. But we know that's a really bad solution. Right? I mean, technically speaking, it's correct. But that's because as humans, we constrained our AI improperly. So instead, we need to maximize for the sum of future rewards. And that's going to produce much better behavior out of our artificial intelligence agent. So uh, you guys get a, a sneak peek under the hood here. This isn't a slide we show very much, but essentially the way that this works, um, there are three neural networks, right? So obviously we want to take the actions that minimize the energy usage. But remember I said that we, we absolutely need to ensure that no bad actions make it through, right? The way that we do that is we actually have three neural networks. Two of the neural networks are to model temperature and pressure specifically. So if you imagine we start off with say 10 million different actions, right? We can send those 10 million proposed actions through our temperature and pressure uh, predictors, right? And if they come back and they violate our temperature and pressure constraints, we know that's a bad action, right? So perhaps 80% of your 10 million actions right off the bat are eliminated. And we say, no, okay, these are bad actions to take. So then you have only 2 million remaining actions, right? And then you can send your 2 million, two million actions through your energy predictor, right? And then we can simply take this set of actions that produces the minimum energy usage, and we can send that to our data center, right, to implement it. Now, of course, I'm dramatically simplifying this problem. There's a lot of other things that have to go into it. But from a very high level standpoint, this is how our artificial intelligence agent works. Now you may be asking like why why do we need AI for this? Like can't we can't we simply, you know, use our, our human intuition to solve this kind of problem? Well, it's it's like go, right? It, there, there are many many ways of operating a data center. So if we took a very simplified example, right? So if everybody imagines that we have 10 pieces of equipment, right? And then each one of those 10 pieces of equipment had 10 possible set points associated with it. Well, then you've got 10 ways of the 10 or 10 billion possible ways of operating a data center, right? Even for this highly simplified example. The point being that there are simply too many ways of operating and we don't even know which one is the best run, right? If the operating space is this big, and then, you know, the <laughs> and then the space that we've only ever explored is this big. Right? then th you can imagine that there's a lot of knowledge that we've never explored before, right? And that's exactly what we found in the data center. 
So, you know, this is kind of our, our flagship slide, right? By doing this kind, using AI for this kind of, um, of optimization, right? It's really a controls optimization. We were able to achieve 40% energy reduction for the same amount of cooling, right? And that really goes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier. We don't know what we don't know, right? Because Google had been operating for the last, you know, 15, 20 years with its data centers in a very, you know, preset, you know, set of ways, right? We had already constrained ourselves in terms of the, 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 the total uh, available space, right? And our AI was able to find better ways of operating while meeting the same boundary constraints, right? So I think, you know, this is my final slide here maybe. Uh, but essentially, remember I said how it's about discovering new knowledge, right? One of the ways that our AI was able to achieve such high energy savings was by overturning decades of knowledge, right? So my background is in mechanical engineering, and as a mechanical engineer, we were always taught that you have to maximize the amount of cooling in as few pieces of equipment as possible because that's going to give you the highest KW per ton per equipment, right? But we learned that that's not actually true when you're talking about systems level optimization, right? Actually, our AI had picked up on enough physics that our engineers, our Google engineers, were not capable of understanding, right? Specifically, it told us that, hey, you need to spread out your energy, you need to spread out your cooling across as many cooling modules as possible, and that's going to produce better energy returns for you. And when I looked at this, and my other coworkers at Google looked at this, we thought this was crazy, right? This, is, this goes against the last you know, 15, 20 years of conventional wisdom. But when we tried this, we actually found out that this is true. Right? And that's a really, really powerful thing. And it had learned to trade off between the physics of the environment. It had specifically it learned that by, uh, by sacrificing a little bit of efficiency at the individual equipment level, the systems level gains were a lot higher. Specifically, you got a lot more energy returns on your pump overheads, right? Your cooling towers got more efficient because they're using less but hotter water. It's things like that that, you, that is hard for humans to pick up on. So um, I guess in conclusion, right, one of the really nice things about AI is that this didn't require enormous investments from, you know, we, you know, we didn't go in there and install millions of dollars of new infrastructure, right? What we did is we took the existing data that was already available, then we took the existing hardware that had been installed in our data centers, and then we took the existing infrastructure, right, for all of this to happen, and then we simply applied DeepMind intelligence on top of it, right? And that was, and there, there was no capex involved with this project. Um, so that is the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have questions or if you have ideas for where AI can apply in your world, come talk to us because we are, we are listening. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.